guys, what's up? It's me, Thomas. Today we're back here with Extra History. Today we got part four of the Buddha's expansion called Stealing Buddha. Hmm. What's going on here? I wonder why they're stealing him. But if I had to guess, looks like the fracture is about to happen. You know how the Christianity had the schism and all? I guess here's a schism. So let's see how things go, huh? Be sure to like, subscribe for more. Hope you enjoyed. Let's go. City state of Chiang Rai, Thailand, 1434. <laughs> Lightning arcs down, crashing into the monastery stupa. Stone explodes, brick dust fills the air. And when the abbot goes to inspect the damage, he finds a luminous green statue. The famed Emerald Buddha. Supposedly made in India 1,500 years before, it had been taken to Sri Lanka to save it from civil war, then to Angkor Wat, then it was captured by a Thai army who hid it in this stupa, I guess. Rare and huh. beautiful possession of it granted an almost mythical legitimacy to any ruler. So, naturally, the abbot's king wanted it sent to his capital in Chiang Mai. But the elephant carrying it stubbornly went to another city instead. And figuring that it was a divine message, it resided there for 32 years before the next king did in fact move it to Chiang Mai. But then an earthquake toppled the stupa it was housed in. Oh so in 1552, a visiting prince decided to take the Buddha back with him to Laos. But then the capital of Laos yeah. was Oof. raided by the Burmese, and the prince evacuated the Buddha to yet another city. There it stayed for 200 years, until a Thai general looted it and took it to Bangkok, where it does, in fact, remain today. At least until, you know, someone captures it again. Yeah, that Buddha's just all over the place, huh? <laughs> hey, had to put it out. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well fed on a busy schedule. Fair enough. Now, you might be asking, why start the episode with that overly complicated story of the Emerald Buddha? Well, legendary origins in India aside, its journey actually provides a pretty good snapshot of how Buddhism spread through Southeast Asia. Originating so, in Northern India, Buddhism spread to Sri Lanka during Ashoka's reign, then out into Cambodia, Thailand, and Burma, present-day Myanmar. And once there, Buddhism would not only be present as beliefs and practices, but as a form of royal legitimacy that underpinned the political order. It's a story that... Okay, I was about to say, wasn't much a pothead based on a Buddhism kind of whirling system? At least it's what I remember, but I can't say for certain because it's been a while since I've seen that series, so... By the way, if you want to look for it, it's the Macha Pothead, the Empire of Water, that one. Like I said, I think I remember that one. It was like Respondent Leader and all. Uh, I can't, I mean, it's the best I can remember, okay? Anyway. It starts in Sri Lanka, a kingdom that, according to Sri Lankan Buddhist tradition, was supposedly converted when Ashoka sent his son and daughter to the island to make it a new capital of faith. Buddhism in Sri Lanka would take on its own character, evolving into a localized belief system that came to believe that it, rather than India, was the center of the Buddhist world. Also, it was a very specific kind of Buddhism that they practiced, Theravada. Early in the Buddhist Theravada. movement, generally dated around the time of the Second Buddhist Council, Buddhism began to experience schism. If you'll remember, Buddha gave his teachings orally, and they were supposedly only written down decades after his death, though some scholars claim this was actually more like a few centuries. This meant that once the Buddhist scriptures were written down in the Pali language of the region, enough time had passed that there were differing interpretations on what was known as the Pali Canon. Adding to uh -oh. that, varying schools developed their own commentaries on these scriptures, leading to more divergent beliefs. Some of Ashoka's rock edicts uh -oh. even feature laws against schism, showing that he tried to prevent the religion from further splintering, especially for his favorite tradition, the Theravada, meaning School, School of the, the Elders. Elders. Now today, Theravada is the only one of these early traditions still practiced, and it adheres to the type of Buddhism we've discussed in past episodes. As you can oh, probably guess from Theravada. the name, it's conservative, stressing adherence to the Pali Canon, reverence for what they see as the historical Siddhartha Gautama, and asserts that one attains Nirvana through practice as a Buddhist monk. Meanwhile, other traditions that we'll discuss in episode right. 5, like Mahayana, have a few other options. Though oh. Theravada lost its tradition of nuns for reasons that are still unclear, some stories claim that in the 10th through 12th centuries, northern India, Sri Lanka, and Burma were hit by several waves of foreign invasions, including the Mongols, which wiped out so many nuns that few existed to train the next generation. But it's probably not quite that simple. It more likely had to do with how Buddhism changed in order to adapt to Southeast Asian audiences, which is something it is uniquely good at. Buddhism is a... Yeah, fair. I guess with other religions, they kind of force the, you know, religion onto them. And, you know, it's either follow us or you're in trouble. Kind of like Christianity back in the day. 
But with Buddhism, well, they were free to bake whatever their hand cannon wanted to to fit their local culture. I think that was the beauty of it all, like I said in the first part, you know, since it was able to change depending on the region they're right? Anyway. It's a shapeshifter. As, here, as a religion that came from the same melting pot as Hinduism, which would be a vegetarian melting pot, just to be clear, Buddhism mm -hmm. shared many of its beliefs like reincarnation and karma. That meant See? Buddhism was good at living side by side with Hinduism to the point that where they coexisted, the two tended to borrow elements from each other. And if an mm -hmm. area had previously converted to Hinduism, it made it fertile ground for Buddhist conversion. Hinduism had already made it out to mainland Southeast Asia, as well as the Indonesian islands, via the trade routes. Ships mm -hmm. from Sri Lanka carried Indian cotton to Indonesia in exchange for spice, and kingdoms in Thailand sold ritual objects like bronze drums to middlemen traders who took them to India. Frequently, the merchant families that sailed these routes actually settled a wing of their family there, usually a younger brother and his wife, to work as an agent. That way, the resident know? agent could buy goods when they were cheapest and hold them until the family ship arrived to take them on. And nice. these merchant settlers developed small communities and built Buddhist temples. Meanwhile, monks still traveled to spread the message of enlightenment, adapting it to the local culture and region. And we can especially uh, see this adaptation Adapt. in bodhisattvas, figures believed to be future Buddhas, spiritually powerful individuals who will eventually become enlightened. Bodhisattvas function in Buddhism in a vaguely similar way like, like saints. saints do in Catholicism. So Buddhism adopted local gods or heroes as bodhisattvas, incorporating elements of Vishnu, Shiva, or legendary kings into them in order to help appeal to local tastes. This melding resulted yeah, in a type of Theravada Buddhism in mainland Southeast Asia that largely stuck to its roots when it came to monastic life and core beliefs, but took on a distinct flavor when it came to art, folk tales, and performance. Though things were a bit different in the Indonesian islands. There, Hinduism had rooted itself deep, and Buddha never gained a total conversion. So instead, he joined the Hindu pantheon to form a syncretic religion oh, known as Hindu Buddhism. And if you're interested in that, oh, yeah, we actually went into this a bit in our series on Majapahit, which you can watch here. Though, to See? be clear, it was not all coexistence. At Angkor Wat, which we also have a series on, man, we do a lot of shows. Buddhism left yeah, the mark, quite literally, with a chisel. Originally a Hindu <laughs> temple complex, later Buddhist rulers would deface the Shiva imagery and install Buddhist statues in its place. And those Buddhist kings felt they were absolutely right to do so because Buddhism also brought a new style of monarchy to Southeast Asia. Well, I'm the the concept are of not a righteous king. That well. Stories of Ashoka's deeds were never forgotten in Buddhism, and he became a model for both judging future monarchs and understanding how power should be wielded to create a Buddhist society. The kings of Thailand, Burma, and Cambodia were not quite god kings, but they did yeah, cloak themselves in an air of Buddhist righteousness that made them semi-religious figures worthy of veneration. These kings, many of whom spent at least some time in a monastery living as on. monks before their coronation, ruled from palaces filled with temples and shrines, having monks as part of their court. Some in the Middle Ages invited monks from as far away as the Himalayas to instruct them in secret rituals meant to increase their power, with a few kings even believed to have supernatural abilities. And these beliefs still exist today. In fact, oh, when Rob really? last visited Cambodia, a tour guide told him that the body of the current king is iron hard and cannot be cut with blades, that he's cool even in the extreme heat, and he was allowed by the Chinese authorities to sit on the throne of the Forbidden City, which, just to be clear, mm. definitely did not happen. This idea of True, a Buddhist that state an ramped up even higher in the colonial period, when countries like mm. Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia turned to the religion as a unifying force that helped define what it meant to be Thai, Cambodian, or Burmese. And Buddhist nationalism proved a major component in resisting and throwing off foreign rule. From monks holding nonviolent protests to assisting in the self conception of newly independent nations. However, this has also had an Sorry. ugly knock on effect that continues into the present day. Some uh -oh. governments like Sri Lanka and Myanmar, that consider Buddhism an intrinsic part of their national character, have often mm. clashed with religious minorities. Sri Lanka denied Tamil really? Hindu citizenship, helping lead to a civil war that ended only in 2009. While in Myanmar, the government has killed 25,000 Muslims and driven over a million into refugee camps in neighboring countries. Yeah, you know we can only hope that. that the Buddha's message of nonviolence and Ashoka's yeah, demonstration of religious part. pluralism Oops. influences minds there. But Theravada Oops. was not the only or even the most popular school of Buddhism. 
As Theravada yeah, moved south, another tradition was sweeping through China, where it would help tame the Mongols, create Kung Fu, and help Japan find Zen, Mahayana Buddhism. But Mahayana. religious tradition. Yeah, but I'll have to cover that later. So, there you go. So, yeah, pretty much all over the place. Definitely exp explains the spreading, because they were able to assimilate with the rest of the culture. So, from what we've seen, I guess the message got crossed. Which, again, with telephones, even if you write it down, you're still gonna mess some things up, you know? Yeah, and let's be real. If we would have learned about the previous stuff, you know, the Civil War and all that, be like, what the hell are you guys doing? Jeez. What is it with the peaceful religions always seems to cause, like, violence? Like, Islam, Christianity, like, no matter what religion, there's always a chance that someone's gonna interpret it to make a, you know, religious feud. Like, the hell? <sighs> anyway, sorry, I had the rant. So, thanks for watching, guys. Till next time, see ya.